Good morning. How are we doing? Oh, you sound good. You know, last week, we wrapped up chapter one. This week, we're going to be in the first 10 verses of chapter two. But last week, we looked at where God wants to share his great love with you and me, and Jesus wants to share his great power with you and me. And he says we are his representatives on planet Earth. And Paul also called us this. He said it another way. We are Christ's ambassadors on planet Earth. And when we look at this, I want you to know God doesn't, we are his plan. You're God's plan. Tell your neighbor, you're God's plan. He doesn't have a backup plan. There isn't plan B. Believe it or not, and I want you to believe it, you are God's plan. And, and we said just, just as, you know, he said to Moses, I was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I worked in them and through them. I'm going to work in you and through you. He, God the Father worked in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was God, but yet he was in the flesh, and he showed us how to be dependent upon the Father. He said, everything I see the Father do, what he tells me to do, I do. That's where we are. We are God's plan, his representatives, his ambassadors, to reach our world, which is broken, hurting, and dysfunctional. We're the plan. Come on, we're the plan, amen? We're the plan. Stand with me if you would. Let's go to God's word today. And the big idea this morning is this. Live the good life that God has for you. Live the good life that God has for you. And that's what he's going to show us here in these verses. We're going to break them down. But take your Bible. Good to be with you today. It really is. It's great to come into God's house and uh, be together, get into the Word, get into the presence of God. So let's say it together as we prepare, and we believe the Lord is going to speak to us today. This is my Bible. This is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. When I read and hear the word, faith comes to my spirit. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God, and it will change my life. I'll never be the same again In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. We have an app. There's an outline. Uh, We have handouts there. You can write some notes down. But let's look at these verses, and I want to read them to you here this morning. And you, here's the Apostle Paul. He's under house arrest. He's a prisoner in Rome, and he's writing, and he says, And you made a lie, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In them. So let's look at this. Let's break it down. First of all, two words that destroy your life and my life. Two words that destroy our life. We look at verse 1. And he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. First of all, he tells us, without Christ, you are spiritually dead without Christ. Dead. Capital D-E-A-D, dead. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You look at Genesis 3, 3. God said, you shall not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, 
lest you die. Now we look at that, yes, we're all going to probably experience physical death. But this is talking about the most tragic, permanent death that there is. Spiritual death, which is separation from God for all of eternity. It's a blunt reality. He's telling us the truth. This is the truth. Life without Christ is spiritual death. You're the walking dead without Jesus Christ for here and for all of eternity, separated from God. Now, here's the two words that destroy our lives. Trespasses. The Bible talks about trespasses. What's trespasses? A failure to hold the path. It's, it's a sin. It's, it's, it's like this. We don't announce, well, you know what? I'm going to be rebellious. I'm going to do wrong. It just kind of happens because in this respect, we're on the path. We're going along, and, and we're really not paying attention. And before we know it, we just kind of wander off the path. We don't say, I'm going to go out there and do evil, but we just kind of wander off, go our own way, do our own thing, and we're not really thinking about it. And then before you know it, you're in danger and destruction. I didn't intend to get involved in this relationship. I didn't intend to, to, to have alcohol take over my life. I didn't intend to have my finances get so out of control, but we just kind of wandered off the path, and we think sometimes, in life, how did I get here? How did I, anybody ever been there before? How did I end up here? Man, well, it's a trespass, a misstep. And then we see another form is called sin. Sin, a failure to hit the mark. And this is a little more intentional because we do this sometimes also in life. You know this is the direction that you should go, but you know what? I don't think I want to do that right now. I don't think I want to go that way. I just kind of want to do my own thing and live my own life. I know that's the way I should be going, but I'm not going to do it. So we have both kinds of sin in our life. And the thing is, sin always separates us from God. It destroys not only us, but the people around us. You think, well, it's my thing, my sin. I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you are. You're going to hurt yourself, and you're going to hurt the people around you, and you always hurt the ones you love. When you think, well, it's my life. I'm going to do my own thing. We hurt somebody else. And see, God hates sin. And he's the only one that can give us this spiritual life. And sin is saying, in essence, I'm going to depend upon me, myself, and I. That's what sin says. But faith says, I'm going to depend upon God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I am going to do life God's way. May your will be done in my life, Lord Jesus. So sin puts a barrier up. And it puts a separation or a barrier between us and God. And then always, sin always separates us from other people and distances us from other people. And you know what? It even separates us from ourselves. That's what sin does. That's one of the reasons God hates sin. Yes, he's holy and yes, he's great, but yet it causes separation. And you're not living the good life that God has planned for you. So here's three sources of our sin. And Paul says of who we used to be. It's like before and after pictures. You want to see some before and after pictures? Who you used to be. Let's look at this, before and after pictures. Well, that's a good change right there. How many like watching those shows where they just do the home makeover? Now, I would love to have somebody come in for about six weeks and just do all this stuff. That'd be the greatest thing, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be the greatest thing, somebody else to come in for six weeks and do all this stuff? Okay, here's another make. Look at that make. I like that makeover right there. That's a good makeover. And then we tried to be kind with the next one. And, and, and you know, <laughs> maybe you like dreadlocks. There's nothing wrong with dreadlocks. So you want dreadlocks? That's okay. We're not saying that. But, uh, you know, makeover, before and after pictures. And that's what he's talking about here. That's what Paul is saying. How, how many have pictures in your home, family pictures? Have you noticed there are some changes through the years in your family pictures? Yeah, you notice that? Isn't that something? Yeah, people change. We change. I, I look at some of those and say, who's that guy over? Oh, that's me. 
Who's that? You know, the kids change. They grow up. Look at verse 2 here. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. The commander of the powers uh, in the air, the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passions, desires, and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. That's from the NLT. These two verses show us a picture of who we used to be before Christ, before we were in Christ. And, and then there's three reasons that we sin. First of all, this world system, our culture. And, and Paul was reminding his readers, reminding us that uh, what they were like before the grace of God got a hold of their lives. You walked according to the course of this world. And what that means is to walk in one general direction over and over and over again, and you can't change direction. You can't deviate from that. It's like the cursed treadmill at the gym. I call it that because I don't go on the treadmill at the gym. I go to the gym, but I avoid the treadmill. It drives me crazy. It really, if I want to walk, I can go outside and walk and see stuff. I'd rather go to the mall and walk around. I don't want to get on the treadmill. I'm sorry. Maybe that's bad. But if you like the treadmill, God bless you. But you're stuck on the treadmill and there's nowhere to go and you can't deviate from the path at the treadmill. The thing is this, this is what he's saying. Walk around locked in and you can't deviate unaware of your condition that you're a spiritual prisoner dominated and manipulated by the loss, dysfunctional culture, society. That's what he's saying right here. The 1920s were the roaring 20s. The 60s and 70s, they were known as the age of, of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know? And then we have now, and it is a cancel culture. It is violence, it is hatred, it is pushing socialism. You know, monks have decided, uh, you know what, the world's the problem and I'm going to separate myself and we're going to live all by ourselves and we're going to become pure and in harmony with ourselves and God. But, you know, it really doesn't work that way because the world isn't our only problem. How many have found out there's some other problems going on beside this culture? There's a devil. Do you realize there's a devil? The commander of the powers of the unseen world around us. And God has allowed Satan limited power and limited time. He can tempt. He, anybody ever been tempted before? Yeah. He can influence. He can even control. I want you to hear this. We don't think so, so much anymore. People, he can control governments. He, control, he, can, he can control geographical regions and areas if given permission by people. That's why I'm calling us to fight in prayer. We're not going to give him permission to take what he wants to take. I'm breathing. That means I need to do good. I'm breathing. I need to pray. I'm breathing. I need to fight. I'm telling the enemy, you can't have America. It looks lost. It looks hopeless, but I'm not giving up. Come on, church. We're the church. There's no plan B. It's up to you and me. Amen. He's at work in a world big time. And right now, he's at work. You know, hell is Satan's final destination. And it's coming soon. It's coming soon. And the thing is, he isn't going to rule in hell. He's going to be the first one thrown into hell. He's not going to torment any longer in hell. He will be tormented in hell. He has limited time to carry out his evil plan. Verse 2, that Satan is at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Or one version said the sons of disobedience. John 8, 44 tells us that Satan is the father of lies. He's a liar. He's the originator of lies. He brings deception confusion. We're either going to follow the father of lies or the father of 
light. He has some weapons. You notice he has some weapons, some big weapons. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He brings confusion. And he likes to push fear upon people. He does the same thing over and over again. Every generation, every century. Come on, can't we figure this out by now? Let's wake up. Come on. It's lies, it's confusion, it's deception, and fear, and fear. <laughs> the more people are scared, the more people will give up just to feel safe. We're seeing it happen today. Come on, we're seeing it happen. <laughs> in the spiritual kingdom, worked out in the natural kingdom, the more we'll give up just to feel safe. 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 He tempts us with lies. He'll tell us things like, no, 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 this is who you are. This is what you need. This will satisfy you. No, 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 this will make you happy. He says things like, you know, those people at church, they, they really don't care about you. Those people at church really don't like you. Those people don't really love If they loved you and liked you, they would do this for you and they do that for you. Say it with me, he's a liar. He's the originator of lies. That's who he is. That's who he is. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve in the garden. And here it is. Has God really said that? He doesn't come up with anything new. He's not creative. Did God say that? Did God mean that? You won't die if you eat that fruit. God knows that you will be like him. He lies. He twists the truth. He lies. This is why you need to know God's Word, because the truth of God's Word will expose His lies every time. You need to know the Word of God so you can expose the lives of the enemy. The lies of the enemy. Then we see we have another problem. We don't like this one. We don't like this one. Here it is right here. I have a problem. It's me. My own sinful nature. Anybody ever had a problem with yourself before? Come on. What do you do, though? Usually take it out on somebody else when you have a problem with yourself, don't you? That's what happens. But we like to blame other people for the problems. Somebody else has to be responsible for my sin. It's, and we just celebrated Mother's Day. God bless you, moms, because what's the first one we go to? My mother. She's my problem. My mom made me this. Moms get blamed for everything. Or my dad. It's my dad. We got to blame somebody else. Has to be the problem in our life. Or the devil. The devil made me do it. No, it's not. No, we have to take personal responsibility. That's a novel idea, isn't it? Take personal responsibility. Here it is, verse 3. Three ways the sinful nature works in our lives. It says, we read it, cravings desires, and our thoughts. Remember, we're on that path. Can't deviate, can't get off. We're trapped. We're spiritual prisoners. We're lost. And we're objects of God's holy wrath. Without God. God for all of eternity. Without God. That's bad news. Say it with me, bad news. It is. If this was the end of the story, bad news. If that was where we end up and there was no more, bad news. Without God for all of eternity, separated for all of eternity, lost in our sins, trapped on that treadmill, we can't get off for all of eternity. These two words, trespasses and sin, destroy our lives. But here's the good news. They meet head on with two words that can change our eternal destiny and change our lives forever. They meet head on. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we didn't need a resuscitation. We needed a resurrection. Hallelujah. So we look to words that change our eternity. Here it is in verse 4. But God. But God. But God. Say it with me. But God. Come on. That's a good word right there. Two words. But God. Trespasses and sin. But God. Trespasses and sin. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What a makeover, before and after pictures. We see we're not controlled by sin any longer. 
Sin doesn't master us. This culture doesn't control us. Our sinful desires don't control us. Satan doesn't have authority over my life any longer. But God, here's the motivation in the heart of God. Love, like we've never, ever seen before. Sacrificial love. Then here's another good word, mercy. The withholding of deserved punishment. God not giving me what I deserve. And that's the difference between grace. And we're going to look at grace in just a moment. Mercy, the withholding of God's judgment. He doesn't give me what I deserve. And here's grace. It's a favor word, and then we're going to see it's much more in a moment. But the giving of undeserved Blessings. We were talking about blessings the other week. Blessings. I'm blessed. You're blessed. Tell your neighbor you're blessed. God gives us what we don't deserve. Man, he gives us his love. He gives us his forgiveness. He gives us his presence. He gives us his life. He gives us his healing. He gives us his wholeness. On and on and on. We're blessed. Hallelujah. The grace of God. His favor. These two powerful words that can change our life forever, but God. How many's had a but God take place in your life? Come on, how many's had a but God show up in your life and take place in your life? Go back to Genesis, Abraham and Sarah. God says, you're going to have a baby. They say, oh, we're too old. He told them that for 25 years. We're too old, too old. But God. When she was 90 and he was 100, they had a baby. Tell me that's not God. Come on. Yeah. Jacob, his name means he's a deceiver. And one night, he doesn't mean an a angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. He meets the son of the living God. You read the Old Testament when it says the angel of the Lord, it's the son of God, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. And he realizes he needs God. He says, bless me. I'm not letting go till you bless me. I'm not letting you go till you bless me. I think we need to get a hold of God like that today. I'm not letting go, God. I need you, Jesus. But God, and his name was changed from supplanter, deceiver, to Israel, prince with God. We see three teenagers in the fiery furnace. They should have been consumed and burned up. But they looked in and says, I, I, didn't we put three? I see four. And one looks like the son of God. But God. We look into the New Testament, and there's a woman caught in adultery, and they were going to stone her, but God, hallelujah. I see another woman that had an issue of blood for 12 long years, got a hold of the hem of Jesus' garment, and but God, I see a man that was Saul, and he hated the church, and he hated those Christians, the people in the way, and he was persecuting them and putting them to death, but on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he had a but. God moment and God changed him to Paul the apostle have you had a but God take place in your life hallelujah you see grace is a noun God's favor but grace is also a verb God's force the power of God in our life grace is a power word the real you in Christ. It says, we're alive. How many people are alive today? I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I think maybe this could be the best but God. We look at John chapter 11. We preach this in the Easter series. But it's too good to pass up. Jesus is away. And his good friends, Mary and Martha, send word that they're Brother Lazarus is unto death, and Jesus delays. I want you to know, you can have divine delays in your life because God's in it. And, and, and he doesn't show up seemingly on time to them. And, and, and when he does show up, they say, Lazarus is dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. Dead. And they say, he's been dead four days. 
And, and this is why I like to go back to the King James because some things are just better than the King James because she says he's been dead four days and by now he stinketh. If you would have cometh, he wouldn't stinketh. But now he stinketh. We just can't say it better than that because sin stinks, doesn't it? But Jesus prays to the Father. God the Father uses His Son on planet Earth, and He says, Lazarus, come forth. And He comes to life, and He walks out of the grave. And He's wrapped like a mummy, and Jesus says, loose Him. And there's a picture there that we can have strongholds and bondages in our life, but Jesus wants to set you completely, completely free. Hallelujah. He wants to make you whole, but God, but God, by God's grace, we pray for people. By God's grace, lives are changed. By grace, we pray for the sick and people are healed. By grace, we witness for Jesus Christ. By grace, we are overcomers. By grace, we persevere. By grace, we have the victory. By grace, we are more than overcomers in Jesus Christ. By grace, we live in freedom. By grace, we are more than conquerors. By grace, by grace, by grace, by grace, by grace, hallelujah. Grace is a power word. It's force raised. Uh, that's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ, you've been raised with Jesus Christ. Then we see seated. We have a new perspective. We've gone from grave clothes to royal robes, from the graveyard to God's throne. That's where we are spiritually right now. Then, the last point, point number three, God's purpose for our new life. Oh, you see, God always has a purpose. He's not random. He has a purpose. There's a purpose for you. He wants you. This is what Paul is driving home. This is what I want us to receive. There's a purpose for you. God wants you to live out His purposes to make Him known. Every one of you this morning, you're a minister. Tell your neighbor you're a minister. I don't know about that. Business. Yeah, tell your neighbor you're a minister. Not a pastor, you're a minister. We're representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We're to make Him known in our business. We're to make Him known in the hospital. We're to make Him known in the classroom, teachers and students. We're to make Him known in the office. We're to make Him known on the job site. We're to make Him known as we drive truck and make deliveries. We're to make Jesus Christ known, hallelujah. That in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God did this so that through all of eternity, you and I would be exhibit A of His grace. We think about the heavenly host. We think about angels and seraphim and cherubim. I don't know I think our God is great. Do you believe our God is great? Greater than we can imagine. I don't know how many created beings that He has. But you and me, created in His image, He wants to put us on display for all of eternity before the host of heaven. Displaying His grace. He has showed us His grace in this life. Grace is good, amen? But He will shower us with His grace for all of eternity. It's limitless. His grace has no end. His grace will go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And He's going to point to you and me, to the host of heaven. Look at Him. Look at her. Look at the greatness of my plan and my work. We're exhibit A to grace that is limitless. Woo, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's okay. I'll get excited about it. Amen. Unlimited grace forever. 
And right now, you are a breathing and living example of the grace of God. Verse 8 and 9. These are so familiar right here. For a grace you have been saved, favor and a force, and that not of yourselves... I, I, I'm interrupting myself. If this grace is so real and so good, shouldn't I be living the good life that God has for me? Amen? Come on. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our works aren't good enough to save us. Our works don't meet God's standard. He doesn't grade us on a curve. The only work God accepts is the work that Jesus Christ performed upon the cross. And it's your faith in Jesus' work on the cross. We can't take credit for it. It's all God. Thank you, Lord. It's all God. So, I'm going to wrap it up with this. This is who you are and what you're created for in Christ Jesus. This, we need to see ourselves this way. The good life that God has for us. I want you to see this. Because Satan doesn't want you to see this. He doesn't want us to know this. He doesn't want us to live like this. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've gone from not being saved by our works to saved by God's good work so we could do good works. This now becomes what it says is our lifestyle. This is our human worth. This is our divine responsibility. This is our lifestyle that we should Walk this out and live this out. We are His workmanship. And this is where I, I like to joke about this. You've heard me say it. You know what? You're a real piece of work. You really are. Now, if you haven't liked telling your neighbor anything else this morning, tell your neighbor this. You're a real piece of work. Hey, this is what God says. I'm just telling you what God says. You're a real piece of work. What does He mean by that? This is what he means. That which is manufactured by a master designer or artesian. Poeo, the Greek is where we get our word poem. This is what he says. You're God's poem. You're God's work of art. Before we were in Christ and Christ came into our life, our lives were without rhyme, reason. Our lives really were out of balance, chaotic without order and wholeness. But now we are God's poem, His work of art. Oh, now tell your neighbor, you're a work of art. You need to see that. Well, there's some famous artists, Van Gogh and Michelangelo and Rembrandt and Salvador Dali and Monet and Picasso and Andy Warhol. Have I impressed you yet, you know? But think about it. when you see, I mean, when you see Andy Warhol's work, you know that's not Rembrandt's work. There's a difference. You see Michelangelo's work, you know that's not uh, Salvador Dali's work. When you see Michelangelo's work, you, you know that's not Picasso's work. Well, what are you saying? I think Paul is telling us when people look at you and me, they should be able to see the work of God in our lives. They have a different lifestyle. They have different morals and values and ethics. They are living a different way. They're not like this culture and this world. And then let me say this. After they see us living a different lifestyle, maybe when we have something to say and we speak something, our words will have worth and value and lasting impact for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We're works of art this morning, church. So here's the action step. 
Here it is. We represent Jesus to our world. And it says, everywhere that Jesus went, he went about doing good. I believe we should do good, spiritually and physically. Let's just go about doing good. Yeah, I know that's being said. I know that's being done. I'm not denying reality, but it's not going to stop me from doing good. It's not going to stop me from representing Jesus Christ. It's not going to stop me from speaking the truth in love. Everywhere I go, I want to do good for Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we're, that's what we're doing. Stand with me, if you would, please. That's, that's our heart. I believe, because of Morning Star Fellowship, this town should be a better town. Amen? I believe because of Morning Star Fellowship, Pittsburgh should be a better town. Amen? Come on. Amen? I believe because of Morning Star Fellowship, this region should be a better place, a better reason, because of Christ in us and us in Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to close with the words of James, verse 20 of chapter 2. Faith without good deeds is useless. Faith without works is dead. But we're not dead any longer. We're living, amen? I'm living for so much more. I'm not going to receive the false narratives, the mantra, the discouragement, the depression of our day. I'm going to receive the kingdom of God that he has for you and me, amen? I say the things I say to you because I believe I have a personal responsibility to help you understand what's going down in the day in which we live And to be ready for who's coming down. Jesus Christ. He's got the best life for you. Don't listen to the lie of the enemy. He has the best life for you. And if you're here this morning and you know you need Jesus, you know you need His life, you need to surrender, invite Him to come into your life and you're not sure about that. You can't afford to be pretty sure. I think I'm sure. You can be sure. I'm just going to ask you, raise your hand with me right now and say, I want Jesus in my life. I want to give my life to Christ. I see a man here in the front. Anybody else say, I got to give my life to Christ. I need him today. I want to be sure. Today's my day. Amen. Let's pray together. I'm going to ask if you're a prayer partner, a team member, come and stand here. We always pray for people. This last song can be over and people are exiting, but if you need prayer, we believe in prayer. But let's pray right now. Somebody's coming into the family of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So join me, if you would, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me and having a plan. Right now, I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me. I surrender. I ask you to come into my life. I want your life. I want to follow you from this day forward in your holy name, the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let's give God the praise this morning. Thank you, Lord.